Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's really fun to see such a great crowd. Uh, I suppose you've never had me in a physics class, though, therefore. So I'm actually a physics professor, came here in 1991, but I've loved minerals ever since I was maybe four years old, and I never outgrew it. So I still have a personal collection. And when the opportunity came to become director and curator of the Mineral Museum, I thought, wow, that's a dream come true. And in fact, it has been. So it's been almost three years now. Only three years as director and curator, but the museum has been celebrating over this past year our 120th anniversary. And so if we cover a minute per year, it'll only take two hours. <laughs> All right, you up for that? No, I, the point is to get over there as soon as possible. But since we are celebrating the museum, I would like to give a, a, a little bit of an introduction, maybe 12 minutes instead. So the organization I thought I'd present would be to focus on people, places, and things. Of course, a mineral museum has to have great things. Otherwise, why would people want to go see it? But I, I've learned it's really important to have great people associated with a great institution. And something that sets us apart, unique, uh, fun, special, is also this place. So let's think about people, places, and things, but not quite in that order. This is really a special place. So this is a photo my wife and I took just this past April. The aurora up here have been magnificent. Sometimes the images you see on your camera are just gorgeous, but they're not quite what you see with the naked eye. But on April 24th, what you see was what you get. It was really magnificent. So we've really been enjoying the aurora this year. And after that, May 1st, winter storm warning. It's like, this is May. We're, we're done with that. And I was giving this presentation, actually, a longer version, the hour-long version, to the Tucson Gem and Mineral Society that week. And since they were in Tucson, I thought they might enjoy what we were enduring. You know, that's after they cleaned up the parking lot in the morning, but the... Uh, the garden was also still covered in snow the day before it wasn't. It's just a pretty special place. But really what makes it special, despite the beauty of the snow and the winter and the beautiful night skies, it's the geology. This is a really unique place. Here we have the geologic map showing the Keweenaw. Complicated but wonderful geology that makes all of this possible. We're here literally as an institution, as a museum, and people because of the geology which led to the native copper formation here. You know, we, we are a product of the environment in a pretty profound way. How much copper is estimated to have been mined during the approximately 150 years of more modern mining in copper country? The mining by the Native Americans probably goes back 8,000 years. But in the more modern 150 years, how much copper was mined. 120,000 pounds all the way up to 12 billion pounds. What do you think? E? I got here louder. D. D. 1.2 billion pounds. Is that the most popular? Oh, not everyone's raising hand. Oh, let, let's go here. All right. We do, in physics, I would give you a clicker. And you got to answer. I love those things because even the bashful students are willing to answer. And then when they see they're not alone, they'll engage with me in a conversation, which is really quite fun. So raise your hand, 120,000 pounds, 1.2 million pounds, 12 million, a few, all right, 1.2 billion, very popular, 12 billion, oh, a few. It's always fun when the winner isn't right. 12 billion pounds. It's just stunning. All right, now if, if you're a winner, I've got to remember who you are and I'm not going to. So you be honest because I've got another question coming up. What's that? <laughs> it, it's incredible. And, but kind of as a little testimony to how much copper occurs up here and how amazing it is, in the pavilion right across the parking lot, we have this giant mass of copper that was literally hoisted by the Army Corps of Engineers from Great Sand Bay, 30 feet deep in Lake Superior in 1991. It took, or two, it took about 10 years of permission from the state of Michigan to actually get that thing hauled out. It was on display at Quincy for a while, 
Now it's here at home on Michigan Tech grounds, although the state technically still owns it. It's about 19 feet long, 34,000 pounds. So really interesting, uh, the European explorations and eventually Douglas Houghton's report uh, led to active mining in the 18, early 1840s. And by 1861, the state legislature realized they needed more mining engineers. Mining engineers in here? Wonderful, and we've met before. Nice to see you again. They, they passed legislation to establish the Michigan Mining School at or near the village of Houghton, 1861. And something happened that delayed it, the Civil War. So the school did not start, but they enabled the legislation again in 1885, and the school did start. Right away, they started buying minerals. You need minerals to teach. Really interesting, the school's trustee, or the, the legislation said the school's trustees or board shall provide for obtaining and establishing a complete collection of minerals of the Upper Peninsula and properly classifying the same. And I like to think that's what we're doing at the museum. They didn't est explicitly establish the museum, but really the identity of the university goes way back to even the founding legislation. And for the Well, the first curator is Arthur Edmund Seaman. Some, sometimes folks wonder why we're called the A.E. Seaman Mineral Museum, and it's because of Arthur Edmund Seaman. He preferred, apparently, to be called A.E. He came to the Upper Peninsula, uh, as a timberman and surveyor, but Wadsworth uh, with the U.S. Geological Survey realized uh, this guy was brilliant and recruited him over to the survey, was associated with the university, and he eventually uh, became professor, department chair, founder of the museum. Uh, he was a beloved uh, teacher, also very important collection builder, and the museum was named in his honor in 1932. This is my favorite picture of him sitting at his desk. There's actually a desk just like this available in Bisbee, Arizona. I would love to have that in my office, but I, I really don't know if it's wise to get it or, but I would love to just pose and have my own picture taken that way. <laughs> it's also really wonderful to hear stories about AE. I've read a lot about him in our archives. They have a lot of information about him. He was truly loved by his students, he built relationships with them. They sent minerals back to, the, to him in the museum later on. Uh, his family, the community really loved him. Uh, and I'll talk more about his family loving him in a few moments. The mineral semenite was named in his honor in 1930. And his son, Willis Seaman, also a tech grad, a curator, geologist, he was one of the co-authors on that paper. I think that's pretty special. <clears throat> well, thinking about the museum, starting around 1902, when AE took some of the teaching specimens, put them together for a display. How many permanent homes has the museum had since 1902? Two, three, four, five, six, or eight? Eight. Four. All in favor? <laughs> so you got to be honest for where you land. All right, think about your answer. Ready for the reveal? For a time, the museum, I guess, did have some kind of a display in the library while it was being moved from Hotchkiss Hall over to the EERC. A lot of the collection was in boxes and storage. I'm not going to count that here because that was not a permanent home. All right, so maybe you want to revise your answer. We like doing that in physics, too. I give you a little clue. Oh, let's vote again. All right, and we'll only count the last answer. What's that? Now you're just giving us money all Yes, oh, that's right. You like, isn't that a mind bender? Yeah. So it was Hubble Hall first, then the creatively named administration building, Hotchkiss Hall, the EERC, and now our current building on Sharon Avenue. So one, two, three, four, and five. Now, how many of you who got the first one right also got five now? Anybody? Oh, we eliminated everybody. Oh, no, because I have a prize. So I think the prize has to go then to our single mining engineering major. 
So recently, the Mineralogical Record magazine, which is like the premier collector's journal, published an issue that focused on Michigan copper country. About 120 photos in there are the museum specimens. There's about five articles about the copper occurrences in the Keweenaw fissure mines. It is just beautiful, and so there's a prize for you. You got one. Oh, so you can give it to somebody else. Because I'm not allowed to leave the podium. Good luck figuring this out. To, all right, thank you. Oh, you all, we could do another drawing, I suppose, but. I just came across this photo that was hidden away in, in one of the shelves. Uh, it wasn't labeled for what year or where it is. I think it's probably the administration building or Hotchkiss Hall, but I'm not exactly sure. Probably none of you were around that long ago. It's probably 1910-ish. Nobody familiar. Okay, good, good. Right. Who served two separate terms as curator? Not adjunct curator. I was an adjunct curator. People say, what does that mean? I say, well, I'm not sure, but I have keys to the museum. They called me the junkie curator for fun. <clears throat> and there's been a couple of interim curators. That doesn't count either. So what do you think here? A.E., Willis, Kirill Spiroff. Anyone have Kirill as a professor? He's probably the most commonly referred to geology faculty when alums come visit me at the museum. Gene Peterman, Kemp Zimmer, Stan Dial, George Robinson, and Chris Stefano. Yell it out. Stan Dial. He was curator a long time, but it's actually Carol Spiroff. <clears throat> I think he went off to study for a while. After, after A.E. died, Spiroff became curator, and then he went off, I think, to study for a while, and in the meantime, for about five years, Willis Seaman became curator, and then Spiroff came back. Well, we are the official mineralogical museum of the state of Michigan as of 1990. And you can see that hanging in the museum. I'm also very glad that we're part of the uh, Keweenaw National Historical Park as one of the cooperating sites. It's a wonderful partnership. But actually, the most wonderful thing, uh, despite many wonderful things, the most wonderful thing in my tenure of being associated with the museum as director and curator is meeting Jack and Phyllis Seaman. Uh, Jack here is A.E. Seaman's grandson. He's 104 years old. This was on his 103rd birthday, and in celebration and recognition of his father and his grandfather, Jack and Phyllis established an endowment for the museum for curation. The most important thing for people wanting to support the museum, donate specimens or money, they want to know that the, the institution is behind the museum, and we're going to be here because a lot of universities have had mineral museums, and they are no more. But we are part of the identity of the university, and this really seals, I think, our, our future. I'm so grateful to them for establishing this, and it was on Jack's birthday we got to be there to celebrate with him. And that actually helps us look to the future, because on the, uh, your right, my one-year-old granddaughter reached up to shake Jack's hand. The original curator's grandson shaking hands with the current curator's granddaughter 102 years apart. It was a really touching moment. But I think that just shows what institutions are like, what the museum means that, you know, we're bringing past to the future, creating value and meaning and uh, even a sense of awe. And also to help do that, I've been working with some teachers to work with some students. And so here we have some uh, fifth grade students looking through microscopes at microminerals in the museum. So here we are. Uh, we've rearranged this gallery, so don't kind of get lost. But I want to point out as you come in, uh, the famous Michigan copper country area up here. But you won't want to miss the fluorescent gallery if you have never been there. It's probably still our most popular exhibit. And there's a new exhibit in there of the sodalite cyanite beach pebbles, more commonly known as euperlites. We have a new euperlite display there. We also have a mining artifact exhibit right here that was just put in. So a lot of fun things, even if you've been here before, 
new things to see and we should try and get over there as soon as possible because I'm talking too much. But one more thing, I'm going to unashamedly let you know that we have an opportunity to acquire two absolutely amazing crystallized copper specimens from the Quincy mine. The story goes is they were brought out personally by a mine captain, we don't know what year, and then they were right away brought to the superintendent's office and on his desk they sat until the mine closed. So they're, they're available for us, they're on display in the museum, you certainly want to see them, but we'd like to have the museum become their permanent home, they're just on loan. We have a crowdfunding opportunity. Uh, I'd love if you could support us a little bit. We're, I think we might have a little barometer showing. We're about one third of the way there. So check that out in the gallery. And uh, oops, uh, it, they're in this special case right over here. So that was more than 12 minutes. Sorry about that, but. <laughs> Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to just mingle around over in the museum uh, and chat. I can tell stories and I hope you really enjoy it. Um, the gift shop is open. Other staff are there. If you have questions, if there's anything you want to find, we'll help you out. So thank you very much for coming and for your attention.